start uh, to um, describe uh, how we model galaxies. And then I will describe the few key applications, um, like the such as interpreting observational data. Obviously, galaxies uh, give us data like the luminosity. They don't tell us a color. They don't tell us the physics. So we need a model to translate that. So when we get observed data, unless we get velocity, the other actually needs to, to be modeled on top. This is important to remember. The one key application is designing galaxy uh, the, the thing that I'm going to talk about on Thursday is predicting galaxy evolution through galaxy formation models. Sorry? Sorry, I speak. <laughs> Here. Sorry. Is it better? Is it better? Can you hear the fact? So why don't you move forward? <laughs> there are a lot of empty spaces. <laughs> now I take this. Do you want the other microphone? The normal I microphone? add the other one. Yes, whatever. Ah, okay. So I don't know. Right. So the main problem of understanding galaxy formation and evolution is understanding what are the processes that drive the evolution of galaxies from the early epochs. So this is the Hubble Deep Field showing galaxies at very high redshift, meaning a couple of billion years after the Big Bang. And now they do evolve into the main types, which are elliptical, massive galaxies, spiral galaxies, and all the rest that doesn't fall into this category, which is called irregular and encompass various species of beasts. Uh, among those, of course, these are the most uh, used, as we will see, as cosmological probes uh, for good reason, but also because they are the oldest and the most massive in the universe. Spirals, of course, because they keep changing a little bit, so they are interesting, but they are not completely clean as cosmological probes. So the lecture of, oops, now study. <laughs> the lecture of yesterday, uh, I pretend to claim that we can model the energetic of an individual stars, and we know this uh, at quite good accuracy. Now, a galaxy is a collection of 10 to the 12 uh, uh, such stars. So the question is whether we can have an integrated model that sum up the energetic of the individual stars and give us a reasonable physical model for a galaxy. How does the spectrum of a galaxy look like? This is a very, uh, is, a, is a really an ideal observation made at the Keck telescope several years ago by the group of Sandy Faber, which shows our spect a galaxy spectrum of an old one of the specific galaxies that we'll mention, uh, look like. It's very complex. So what you have here is the flux as a function of wavelength. And you see, first of all, you don't have any flux until roughly 4,000 angstrom. The sharp rising flux is what is known as 4,000 angstrom break, and in particular, this is a redshift and an aging effect. Yeah, oops. Excellent. Uh, can we actually, are we able to model all this complexity, and in particular to do that for different types of galaxies? <coughs> this effort is called population synthesis. <laughs> Imagine this is a stellar field in the Milky Way. It's a very close, it's an Hubble Space Telescope image, but it's very close. Here you can distinguish bright main sequence stars from the little dots that are dead white dwarf. This is very close. It's like if you take a snapshot of a population, you can distinguish very nicely the ages of the pos this population. This only happens in the Milky Way and only for specific region of the Milky Way. <clears throat> if you go into the halo of the Milky Way, you start to lose resolution. This is a cluster of stars 
what you can distinguish here, if you understand galaxy evolution, you will see that you can really pick red giant stars. You will pick main sequence stars. You even pick a blue horizontal branch star. In numbers exactly predicted by lifetime of stellar evolution. Super cool, but this just limits it to the Milky Way. So you start mm -hmm. losing resolution. When you go to a galaxy, Honestly, I would tell you, who care about the individual species? I mean, you need to care, but the only thing you're going to see are the most luminous ones in terms of light. They are going to make you spectral. The mass, instead, is highly contributed by all the stars you don't see. And this is a, a nearby spiral. If you go at Rashi 5, the only thing you see is a blob of light. So we need to make the physics of these things. So the first people that... Uh, enter this uh, approach, um, started a technique called optimized population synthesis. Sandy Faber, Bob O'Connell here in Virginia, and Eduardo Bica in Brazil said, okay, I don't know much of the physics, but I want to get the ratio, for example, as Will was mentioning. So I want to get an optimal representation of this observed spectra. What do I do? I take a different stellar spectra, and I combine them with arbitrary coefficient, with arbitrary weights, until I get the final results. So it is optimized until you get a fantastic fit, and you do get a fantastic fit. However, obviously this approach may not give you a physical spectrum. For example, to match this particular spectrum, you may need red giant branch that live on the red giant branch phase that we saw yesterday, much longer than their internal cores would allow them. So it means, of course, you are missing something else. But for applications such as getting velocity dispersions, potential of galaxies, and redshift is as good as possible. But you can't make prediction uh, as a function of cosmic time. Uh, this is what the second approach, that is one, the no dominant approach, <laughs> thought instead, thanks to the pioneering work of Beatrice Tinsley, who is a British-born astrophysicist who was, however, publishing mostly while she was at Yale. Uh, she was active at the time stellar evolution was ramping up. And then she thought, look, instead of combining randomly, let's take the energy and time scales the stellar evolution theory is telling us. For example, that a two solar mass star burn 0.3 solar mass is equivalent to fuel on the red germ branch. This gives us a time scale, and this is going to tell me how much I have to wait at the spectrum. So this is, of course, was a winning approach, because as incorrect as stellar evolution could be, and of course we are making progress on that, it gives you a physical model whose age can be varied from zero age, with the most massive stars, up to 10 billion years, in a consistent way. And you can make galaxies a different redshift, which can evolve back and forth into other models. Uh, the second person that made a difference in this approach is Alvio Renzini, who stated in 1981 the fuel consumption theorem, which is the conservation of energy for the population model case, which I also adopted in my models, but uh, it was Alvio who stated that. And then this is Gustavo Brusual who started from the 80s, made, started to calculate the conspicuous mass of models using the production of stellar evolution models from the Padova group, for example. And they, he also made available a lot of uh, uh, software tools that people can play with the models. And here we are just displaying how good friends we are, no competition. Uh, and so this, is, uh, the, this evolution population synthesis allows us uh, to really play galaxy evolution as a function of cosmic time. I should mention there are other groups uh, doing models and not many others, uh, but uh, let's say our two models are the most extreme that are present in the literature now. So now let's see how we calculate these models. We have discussed this yesterday. So we have the energy which is the emission per star mass, erg per second. We do have it from the stellar model. We know the time scale. 
So we know how, how long these stars shine before fading away. <coughs> we have the spectra, we think we have. Actually, <laughs> there are several cold stars for which spectra are not very well known, but we don't need to enter this detail. What we obviously need, then, is the mass distribution of the individual species, which I call initial mass function. Of course, we know it's not flat in the universe, right? We don't have an exact number of low mass and high mass stars. The problem is, first principle physics does not tell us, it's not able to predict the initial mass function out of a gas cloud. <coughs> and so people started from the 50s, especially the work by Ed the Salpeter, started to count the stars in the solar neighborhood. In the 50s, they could only go down to, point, to one solar mass. So this is a plot that shows you the number of stars per mass, per stellar mass, from the point one, which is the limit of hydrogen, central hydrogen ignition, up to roughly the largest star that we can observe, that is around 100, 120 solar mass. And so what people have found, initially this is the red line, is a single slope power law, which tells you that there are fewer high mass stars than low mass stars in the universe. Um, actually, Salpeter only saw things up to one solar mass is people used to extrapolate down to their lowest mass, which is not correct, right? <laughs> he didn't have the telescope in the 50s to see that. This was done by these other people, which are Krupa, the Cyan Line, and in particular Chabrier, which find consistently a knee suggesting that the initial mass function is actually a double power slope. And there are not as many low mass stars as predicted by the extrapolation of the Serpita. So this is what we consider Milky Way type of mass function. And the question that people are brainstorming exactly these years is whether this is a universal in whole universe, in all galaxies at every redshift, or if it varies. And as you can imagine, this is a spicy topic. I will discuss this on Thursday. If you change the mass function, we change the photons for reionization. We change the global chemical evolution. There are a lot. Of, we change the dark matter. So it's, we can change it, but it changes catastrophically a lot of other things. In particular, people at Yale, Conroy, and Van Dokum have advocated that the most massive gas galaxies are inhabited by lo the lowest mass stars. I'm going to come back in a couple of days on this problem. For the sake of the model, this is just a function. You can invent any, plug it in a, in a code, and calculate an integrated model. It is here. So essentially, when I want to calculate integrated spectrum, which I'm coming about, I take the individual fluxes of the stars, I convolve them with this function representing their mass distribution. I integrate them between the lower limit, which is very well known. This is nuclear physics that tells you that below that you don't ignite hydrogen. And the upper limit, which is less well known, but is reasonably accepted to be around this limit because of the Eddington limit for the luminosity and evaporation of stars. Then you integrate, and you get an integrated model. If you integrate in wavelengths, you will get your spectral energy distribution. <coughs> so the result is this. So what I call stellar population model is indeed the integrated, the theoretical spectral energy distribution. This is for an example, is a 0.5 billion year of age. So these prototype galaxies formed 0.5 billion years in the past, has metals as in the sun, uh, and it was born in a single generation of stars. This is important because then I'm going to release this assumption. And then you have, in principle, fluxes from the UV to the near infrared. And each portion of the spectrum is featuring absorptions that, besides giving you the redshift for, for baryonic acoustic oscillation, they also give you the physics of the galaxy. For example, we see that this galaxy has quite a pronounced magnesium feature that's going to tell us something about the chemistry. Uh, the galaxy also display, display near-infrared features that are typical of carbon stars, so we can do a lot of stuff. This is uh, from my models of 10 years ago. 
uh, the spectral resolution was about 10 angstrom. What we can do now is outrageous. <laughs> Look at the green thing. This is 20,000 spectral resolution. I'm making a bit of fun about this because these models are very time consuming to calculate. And then galaxies, spectra, are broadened by velocity dispersion. And in fact, you don't need such a high resolution. But it's important because in principle you can also analyze dwarf galaxies which are very small velocity fields. I assume you understand, <laughs> because I see a few faces, that uh, this is the intrinsic resolution of your emitted spectrum. But if a galaxy is big, lives in a potential well that is large, it is affected by its own dispersion in velocities, this acts in broadening these lines. And this is how, in fact, people measure velocity dispersion of galaxies, by the broadening of known absorption lines. Okay? And we can, you can do that, but if you have the highest resolution, you can broaden this at your leisure. The black is something that is similar to the Sloan uh, spectrograph. So we can model the light. We can go fancy with that. The other part that we need to model is the dead stars. So the amount in stellar remnants. So yesterday I said that we know we, they evolve. Each star below eight solar masses is going to give us a white dwarf remnant. This is going to wait in this range of solar masses. Every star in this range is going to give us a neutron star whose mass we take at the Chandra circle limit. And each star with mass is above 40 solar mass is going to give us a black hole. Now, how people model black hole remnants is in fact a matter of debate. In my models, I take uh, that each star leaves me half of it in a massive black hole. So if I have 100 solar mass stars, I get a 50 solar mass black hole. This, as you can imagine, is quite favorable in getting heavy weight without adv advocating too much dark matter. There are other schools <laughs> that give much less weight to the remnant black hole. So in, that is also making it more difficult to, to form supermassive black holes in the cores of galaxies, as we will see, because you need to find them from somewhere. But I wanted to say here we are reasonably sure, while in this case there is a little bit of debate. And then you can calculate the evolution of stellar mass parallel to the evolution of light. This is there is this review that I recommend on galaxy masses, dark matter, and all the alike, which we have written. This is the stellar mass normalized to one for a population born at this epoch and evolved until 15 billion years. If you have a type of a Milky Way IMF, the population will lose roughly 30% of its stellar mass just due to passive evolution of the star. So when you match it to dark matter, you have a 30% that you need to subtract away. Interestingly, if you know literature on dark matter, 30% is typically the proportion that people find in galaxies in terms of dark matter. But please, uh, your student, appreciate that. If I change the IMF, I can wash away that 30% quite easily. Look, at, for example, at this line up there. This is one of the bottom heavy IMF advocated by Conroy and Van Dockum. With this IMF, the stellar mass does not evolve at all. And you understand why? Because all the, star, the stars are small mass and they don't die. So all the stars keep leaving, okay? If I take that, I don't need anything to replenish that hole of mass. And your galaxy, which is the case for the most massive elliptical galaxies we will see, require zero dark matter. So this is important, you remember, the problem of deducing dark matter in galaxies goes parallel to the initial mass function of the stars that you impose them. Now, fantastic so far, but we have a model galaxy with a single generation, while galaxies are very complex. Some, star, some galaxies would form stars violently, they are called star bursts. Others, as I will argue, especially on Thursday, probably stop forming stars at Rashid 3. These are the massive elliptical. Spirals keep cooking stars at a steady pace that goes proportionally to the gas consumption. 
So this already shows you that we need one more variable, which is another function, sorry, this movie I like, is <laughs> which actually uh, would like to model the birth and death rate of stars. We will see this is the major, probably the major uncertainty in galaxy formation models because we don't have a first principle description of this function. So we call it the star formation rate. And again here, we can go fancy, okay? I'm extreme, extremizing that because we know quite a few basic facts, which I think we deduce from galaxy evolution. But in principle, this is a function of time, this time, which you convolve further your single birth, and you, in this way, can model extended star formation rates. Now, very much used, this is so I'm going to go through things that people have used in the literature. Gustavo Brusuali, 1983, suggested a simple form which is exponentially declining. That makes sense, even in fundamental physics. If you have a, a, a ball of gas and let it uh, dissipate with Avogadro's law, you will get roughly this behavior. Um, it has been shown that our own spiral has indeed consumed the gas in an exponentially declining way since Rashi 3, maybe Rashi 4 even, the hail of the Milky Way former Rashi 5, uh, which means that consuming the gas, then there will be a gas re-emitted, of course, by the dying stars, but you do this very smoothly. So this is an approximation that goes well for spiral. Starburst, instead, for starburst you need a violent episode, so we assume a constant low uh, for a certain amount of time. The amount of time is, of course, complicated. We will see the interplay with massive black holes. You essentially don't know where to stop your function. You can stop it by starvation, so when you finish gas, which is also a fact. Uh, so we put forward this that is truncated, which is a step function, which should be instead very good for elliptical galaxies for reasons that I will explain, in which you have an early constant star formation, which then is abruptly quenched by actions which are either the feedback from black holes or essentially the consumption of gas. Um, a few years ago, I put forward this one that has been confirmed by a few other groups, uh, um, by Navin Reddy at uh, Rashif 3, uh, Kazai Popovich and these people, which is exponentially increasing. This is interesting because it's much embedded in the cosmological web. Uh, this was found to model galaxy redshift 2 to 3 very well, where the consumption of gas is not declining, but it's actually exponentially increasing, which may suggest a gas inflow from the cosmic web up to a peak of star formation, which then would decline afterwards. This is also in better agreement with the fact that the cosmically we see the star formation peaks at Rashid 2, to a bit lower before, um, and then its decline at our epoch. But having said that, you can combine function, and people do this in the literature. Now, let's look at the model a little bit to understand a few degeneracies, which help me understanding why Maybe it's harder to disentangle the effect of modified gravity that I mentioned yesterday. So the primary mo uh, parameters are age and metallicity. Metallicity is the chemical composition. These are the things that you want to extract from your galaxies or that you want to predict because they regulate galaxy formation. So in the first panel, I plot uh, the age dependence on the spectrum, theoretical spectrum. This is a very young galaxy, which has a lot of... Uh, Flux, this is lambda in micron, this is the UV, due to the massive stars. After one billion year of evolution, which in terms of Rashi is just Rashi 3, all these stars are dead if this galaxy is passive, so no star formation added, and you get this type of spectrum. And then you have, unfortunately, 10 billion years in which <laughs> the spectrum doesn't change very much. It does actually change a little bit in the near infrared due to the addition of these stars. I'm going to come back later, but otherwise it's quite static. So most of the action is happening in a super small redshift range. So astrophysics is nasty in this sense because the age metallicity degeneracy work a lot over most of the cosmic time. 
So this is uh, the effect of age. The effect of metallicity is essentially to make the galaxy spectrum deviating from a black body. This is a 10 billion year population with a halo type abundances, so very low metal. And you see that uh, it is super blue and uh, very much uh, lacking absorption features simply because you don't have those metals. This is a, a galaxy with solar metallicity, can be the bulge of the Milky Way. And uh, the Planckian is broader because you have absorptions. And this is a twice the solar metallicity, maybe similar to the most massive elliptical. And what you see is again an announced near infrared and a lot of absorptions. So obviously you can imagine see that there is a very nasty effect that is a theoretical point that people have recognized back at the beginning of the 90, Guy Wurtz and collaboration, which is known as the age metallicity degeneracy. <clears throat> this is, is not an accident, it's not our mistake, it's inherent in the stellar tracks. It's the fact that an old population will be dominated by low mass stars that are cold. And likewise, a metal rich population gives you cold atmospheres that resemble older stars. The, it works as bad that if you see this plot, uh, let's look at this plot, uh, this part here. The red is a model and the black are data for a star cluster in the Milky Way that we use as calibrators. We can gain fantastic fits uh, with beautiful chi-square, either with uh, an age of 3 billion year and solar metallicity, or with an age of 7 billion year and half solar metallicity. Uh, there is no statistics uh, that is, uh, allow you to discriminate among these two chi-squares. So this is, of course, impact on galaxy formation, because when people tell me, oh, I have an age data galaxy, Rashi 1 is exactly 4 billion years, the question is whether this has been taken into account. This difference in billion years, of course, uh, makes a lot of difference in redshift. Uh, and this is done at high resolution, so the high resolution doesn't help too much here. For this star cluster in particular, we know that this is the right answer because it's a star cluster in the Milky Way and we can age date it independently on the models. But all, for all other galaxies in the universe, you don't know what is the right answer. So what we use is usually mock simulation to try to constrain these techniques. But for you, it's just important to understand that this problem exists. The other degeneracies are the degeneracies between your decided mode of star formation, age, and if you put the dust or not. I'm doing this in a simplistic way just to explain you the case. So the model up here, tau is a parameter that tells you for how long the galaxy is forming stars, while t is your age, so it's the time at which you look at that galaxy. And here you see these galaxies are star forming, so they have a conspicuous flux in the ultraviolet. After that, they decline. The red galaxy has the same very long star formation, so real spirals, but I suppressed, I put dust on top of it as a screen just to, to depress the ultraviolet flux. And then this model goes down. And in this wavelength range, which is logarithmic, so this is quite long, it's quite degenerate with an old galaxy that has stopped forming stars instantaneously. This is just a Of course, if you have data here, which usually you don't have, because this is the ultraviolet, and you, I mean, we don't have much access. Far infrared, is, we are doing better with latest mission. You can break degeneracies. But this is just for you to appreciate that, in fact, Galaxy evolution is complicated, and you needed to explore many, many models for that. Now, there has been a lot of progress in the recent 10 years, of which I want to highlight two, uh, which have been actually pretty much helped revolutionize in the field. The one was uh, very much still discussed, the contribution of... Uh, uh, yes, in Totti and Branch started that I mentioned yesterday. If you don't remember what they were, you need to remember that these are giant stars that are very red, so they increase the flux in the near infrared. And the other one, which will be crucial for galaxy formation, is the inclusion of chemical elements in proportion, 
non-solar with respect to the, the solar neighborhood. So the first thing, just to sketch it, these stars are very nasty because they pulsate. I described yesterday how evolu the evolution is complicated. So usually, they've been ne neglected in the models. However, it was shown that if you include these stars, you get an enhanced near-infrared flux with respect to models not including these stars. And also, you see a lot of molecules. Now, interestingly, these models have been used to study high redshift galaxies. Why high redshift galaxies? For two reasons. These stars uh, are bright in quite massive galaxies, so those that uh, feature galaxy high redshift first. And then, because NASA has uh, launched this fantastic far infrared satellite, the Spitzer, that is looking at the far infrared uh, observe frame, and so near infrared rest frame of galaxy redshift three. One above one. So this is just to show you the effect. This was from a popular talk, but this was the, the paper that first said that in fact without these stars you don't match the data, and this result is still valid. This is a, the points are galaxy around redshift one. The first are from the cosmos field, I guess these are um, Hubble Space Telescope data, and the, the, the other three are Spitzer telescope data, and you see, these are models without including those red stars, and these are my models with those red stars. Um, and essentially, you lack flux, and there is no other way you can put that flux. It's not dust, it's not AGN. Uh, because it's very confined to the rest uh, frame near infrared. I'm going to come back to this on Thursday because this is uh, important when we do the mass function of galaxies, the function of redshift. <coughs> the other breakthrough was the recognizement, which actually I'm, I'm going to show you a plot, uh, come from uh, Daniel Einstein, who is famous for the DAO, but one of the first paper he did was uh, to show that maybe galaxies did not, uh, well, he didn't know the answer, but he showed a mismatch between data and models, and I'm going to show you. So the problem is the following. Look at all these, these absorptions. You have here titanium oxide is an alpha element, okay? It has been ejected for supernovae type two. Uh, then we have got iron. Iron is ejected for supernovae type one. The two, we know from yesterday, evolve on completely different timescales. The first generation of this model was calculated, assuming that these elements would scale as in the sun. For simplicity, because it's quite complicated to calculate the stellar model change in this ratio. But then why the sun should be representative of an elliptical galaxy where stop performing stars at redshift three? The sun is an evolved star in a spiral disk. And so what then we have done is to play with the strengths of this abundance ratio to see how much the lines were changed. So this is the plot uh, published by Dan Eisenstein with the first Sloan data. And what he plot in these things uh, are ratio of absorption lines, okay? So this is, for example, hydrogen line versus magnesium hydrogen line versus uh, CN, which is a carbon-nitrogen mo molecule. And you see, and the, the lines are models, and you see that the data are off the models completely, even including generous error bars. This was done with these models that were available at the time. Now, if you have an, a spectrum and you see such a dramatic and clear offset, it cannot be age metallicity because this would, would act on all the other lines. It must be the chemistry. So what we have done here in this series of papers that are cited down there is to change in the models the ratio of alpha elements to iron. I will argue on Thursday that this is a, the, the best cosmic clock for galaxy formation that you can have. Alpha over iron equals zero means the galaxy is solar scaled. An enhanced ratio means the galaxy is rich in alpha element and depleted in iron. 
work with mean, but what you have to remember, that means uh, short formation time scales. What I show here, so these are the new models. Uh, the red are the elliptical galaxy of Einstein that now fit the models with an enhanced ratio. They are far from being solar scaled. And the green are globular cluster in the Milky Way for which the ratio is measured. We use them as calibrators. So this globular cluster have resolved measurement of spectroscopy of individual stars and they show this element ratio. Um, so this is, uh, has been interpreted as uh, the interplay between supernova type one and, and supernova type two and one and became famous and as the anti-hierarchical baryon formation, um, which has led the, to, a, to a revision of galaxy formation model by De Lucia and collaborator. We'll talk about this on Thursday, just to tell you how that works. Now, we, I want to briefly uh, touch upon the application, moving to the conclusion of this talk, which we're going to use on Thursday. In particular, I've included the target selection for which there was an, a question before, why there were no galaxies in that Rashiv range, which I think I want to expand a little bit. So, of course, how do you apply the models? The first thing is to get the physics of your galaxy, observed galaxies, because otherwise you, you have no idea. In particular, you want to get age, the star formation history, chemical composition, and blah, blah, blah. And massing stars, so that you can constrain your dynamical masses. Then you have, uh, you can perform target selection of cosmological survey. Uh, and I, I use will talk that was very nicely put before. He wants to see BAO, for which he wanted to get the most slowly evolving galaxies in the universe. Because in this way, is going to get less bothered by galaxy evolution effects. So, he needs to select galaxies that are evolving passively, and passively, for what I mentioned before, is a very little star formation. So the way to go is to do models that resemble that, and then see how you cut your survey. And we'll go from that. Um, an immediate application of the age date of galaxies is called the cosmic chronometers which I'm going to do on Thursday. Likewise, uh, uh, discussing galaxy formation models. So the first thing, and I'm also using a plot from Adam, uh, from our boss work, you fit your model to data. And they fit gloriously, whatever that means. Because, because of the degeneracy I told you, that doesn't mean that these are the physics of galaxy, but in principle, you take a fitting tool, which is another thing that is quite complicated, it's not obvious, but uh, I don't have time to discuss that. You, you take a suite of models, and then you perform a fit, and you calculate the chi-square. So, for example, this galaxy turned out to be 5 billion years, um, having metals like in the sun, and uh, an equivalent massing star of 10 to the 10. So it's not a very massive galaxy in this case, it's just in the middle. Uh, and then you get your velocity dispersion. So this is the way you use these things. Now, a few words on the target selection. So for the baryonic acoustic oscillation experiment, which Will has described at length, those guys wanted passive galaxies and a sample that uh, comply to an early constant mass sample over a certain Rashiv range. So this plot, the target selection is finally published in this read et al. paper that Will has mentioned, but in my paper before we have shown how we did it. So these are simulations of galaxies with different stellar mass. The blue points are between 10 to the 11, 11, 2.5 at this redshift. The green, you increase the mass and the red are the most massive galaxies. This is important because BOSS turned out to be fantastic, not only for cosmology, but also for galaxy evolution, because it gave us the largest number of the most massive galaxies at the intermediate redshift, with, with very strong consequences. So, what I'm plotting here, this is a bit of a nasty y-axis, is a combination of magnitude. Don't worry too much about that. Uh, is essentially a ratio of colors in order to see how this galaxy evolves. 
And this is the I band magnitude, which also gives you the limit of the survey. And all the lines you see are models that put in this plane. And then you see that if you want to get the most massive galaxy, you need to cut your survey there. If you want to get it at a certain redshift, you will have another cut this way. So BAO, boss, wanted to have galaxy mostly a redshift above 0.4, and that's the thing that you asked before, and with a constant mass. So we worked out, starting from a previous selection by Einstein and et al., these things. Then we got the real data. This is one plot that show you the CMAS sample, the fraction of galaxy with certain mass, and in the redshift range between 0.4 and 0.6, you see that, in fact, mass doesn't change. Yes. It was not obvious. So these are real data. That means the target selection has worked. If you go up in redshift, you see that, of course, then you start to lose. <laughs> the galaxy you pick are more massive simply because they get fainter in an effect that we knew. To answer your question, the sharp cut at 0.4 is due to the target selection and is due to the fact that below redshift of 0.4, you would contaminate your galaxy sample with star-forming dusty galaxies. So there, it was a matter of deciding which type of contaminants you want, whether you want a sharp redshift distribution, but only passive galaxies, which is what was the fact at the end, or if you wanted to have a mixed sample, which is shown here, but there you would have a harder time to classify those galaxies. Also remember that Sloan only offers us five bands. So we are lacking wise, we are lacking other filters. But that's the reason why there is a sharp redshift distribution. If you would release that constraint, in target select, the redshift distribution is shown in this, as this diagonal line uh, and comes from spectral breaks. So it is exactly, so the result is consistent with what we put in. And, and the reason is to avoid the star forming dusty galaxies of lower mass, by the way. So this is just, a, an, oops, sorry, this is just the last plot. Uh, we have verified also which type of galaxies are in the BOSS survey. So when you acquire 1.2 million spectra, it's not that you can look at every spectra one by one and see, oh, that's it. So what we have done, we use, uh, observe the morphologies in cosmos for a, a check sa a control sample of that. And it turned out that the models were very good in predicting that the reddest of this target selection, you, there, were, sorry, there were only early type red galaxies, while in, this, in the blue side you find a lot of late type morphologies, spirals, and also below here, as you notice, red and blue points overlap completely. This is a spectral degeneracy. So here you would not be able to, to modify them. And this is the last slide. In this other plot we show that the wishful thinking worked and the both galaxy were actually passive, which is going to be important for galaxy formation because there was no, only 4% which you show here this is a complicated target selection, but the only thing that you want to, understand, to remember is that the gray point are all the galaxies in the Sloan 3. And these are galaxies that show different type of emission line, which can give you an AGN, can give you star formation or whatever. And this is the minority of points, it's 4%, and, and they are all on the blue side of the target selection. So your CMAS sample is very clean. Okay, so I think I stop here. And uh, if you have any questions, please go ahead. On one of your plots with the spectra, you should, had a line that said night sky. I was wondering what that oh, referred no. to. So, this is a, so the question is, uh, there is a night skyline. Do you want to elaborate more? Or? Yes, so 
This is observation, right? So you will get, this is a ground-based spectrum. So we are prone to get lines that are emitted in the atmosphere. They are particularly nasty in the near infrared, okay? Starting from here on. The, the Hubble Space Telescope data would not have this problem. The unfortunate thing is that you are, if you are not able to distinguish them, and you, what the observer do is to take a spectrum of the sky only, and then compare with the objects subtracted away. Uh, because these are not going to tell us the physics of galaxy, the IMF, and the age and the metallicity, but they are altering the absorptions, uh, the strengths of it. So they are very nasty. And as we will see, people that are using telescopes to distinguish the initial mass function of galaxies work mostly in this region, where it is not shown here because it has been cleaned, but there are a lot of night skies lines. So, yeah, bad. But it's nothing to do with the models. Further questions? Uh, so, when you were talking about star formation rate as a function of time, you said for high redshift uh, galaxies that the star formation rate goes like e to the plus t over tau. Uh, what do you mean by high redshift in that case? Like Good point. So uh, the work I, we have published, we have used uh, galaxies from the Cosmos Service Rashif 2. Navin Red and Chuck Steidel, they have used galaxy Rashif 3. Okay. I believe if we would have decent data, this would go up to Rashif 4. The time scale is very short in there. So it is everything above 2. Okay. And this, but this may tell us about the fundamental mode of, of cosmic star formation rate because it's like the gas is being replenished and used before it is expelled out. So it tells us about feedback. So is there a above two? Good. More questions? Anyone? I, I asked you this question even yesterday, but like, since now you have described your galaxy formation model, does this model predict something about the bias you expect for the galaxy, and uh, is this anywhere close to what we observe? So, the mass function, <laughs> based on the galaxy mass function, is a way of checking that, in a way, even if it is. A, Usually, either it covers a large volume and then compass a large variety of galaxies, or in the case of BOSS, it is really focused on the most passive, massive galaxies. They will certainly be dominating the clustering, as we know, anyway. So, uh, the plot for the mass function I plan to show on Thursday, okay? But what we found using BOSS, uh, which is consistent with other findings, but because BOSS has so many galaxies, we put it on a firm statistical ground, is that the most massive galaxies uh, in the BOSS survey are in excess to prediction based on millennial simulation, semi-analytic models, catalogs, which will have an intrinsic bias. Actually, before Thursday, I needed to inform myself on exactly what parameter they have assumed, because it is an assumption. There you can, how do you solve the discrepancy? Because it also doesn't change with redshift in the data, while of course it does change in the models, because galaxies keep forming hierarchically. Uh, that, of course, put your constraint. In principle, you could, what I would do, you could use the data, fix the parameters there. It has usually been done at redshift zero using the Sloan for, uh, survey, but redshift point four, five, the volume helps you. I would do it at that rush. You fix the parameter there and see how your model evolves. With that bias, you derive. So, shortly, there are frictions at the massive end. So, we got time for more questions. Are there any? Well, if not, let's thank Claudia again.